Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. I want to welcome you to Leatherwood Church. I just have a few announcements. The youth meeting is tonight from 6 to 7.30. Uh, following the service today, uh, today is Leatherwood out to lunch. Um, we'll be going to Evermore's Restaurant in New Bethlehem right following the service today. And I heard their special is stuffed pork chop. Is that correct, Margaret? Stuffed pork chop. Is that what you said? Okay, so stuffed pork chop uh, is a special today at Evermore's. Um, fellowship team meets tomorrow at 6.30. Food bank is Tuesday from 1 to 4. Board meeting is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Also, if you brought us a meal and you would like your dishes back, they're in on my desk in my office, so please take them uh, back with you. Uh, also, uh, if you would like any vegetables, they're on the back uh, as you exit the church today. Take as many as you would like. Uh, and a glow is this Tuesday at 7 at Face House, and Debbie Ecker will be speaking, so uh, you won't want to miss that. Also, there is no Bible study this week. It's every other week, um, so if you didn't make the first one, you didn't miss uh, anything that you can't make up, so we're going to be for not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, reading chapter 1. Uh, so if you didn't make the first one uh, for Faith Commander, uh, you can still, it's not too late to join us. Anybody need a book? We've got a couple left. Um, we did have a record crowd, so uh, let me know if you're coming so I know how many more tables to set up. So, uh, Anybody else have any other announcements this morning? All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much for just uh, allowing us to come and to seek you. Father God, we just want to be in your presence, to be full of your Holy Spirit, and Lord, to bring our praises to you. Lord, hear our prayer. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us go ahead and stand and greet one another this morning and say hello. Give somebody a big hug. Maybe tell them about it. Thank you. 
نویسیم Anyone else? 
on this for God, but uh, today marks, I don't know whether that's a praise or a prayer request, but today marks nine years as your senior pastor. So, uh, uh, Phil, I'm not old enough to be anybody's senior pastor for nine years. Eh? But uh, let's, let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just uh, are so grateful that we serve a God that's not far off, that's not distant, and that's never there when we need Him. But Lord, we can come to You at any time. And Lord, we can ask a request. And, and Lord, we can go to You in prayer. And Lord, we know that You are right there. Lord, we have the proof of it. Lord, we think of, of all the things that You've been doing. Lord, we think of Jim as he's been released from having to go every day to the hospital for treatments. And Lord, we thank you for bringing him through this. Lord, we thank you for his salvation that occurred so many so many years back. And Lord, how you have kept him uh, faithful. And Lord, we just thank you for the visitors who are here today. And Lord, we just ask your blessings upon them. And, and Lord, for the for the jobs that were, were saved and not lost. And, and Lord, we, we thank you for that. And for uh, Big Woods Bible Church, Lord, we ask that you would be, be a blessing to them as well. Lord, we thank you for Randy Evans coming and speaking last week and, and sharing, Lord. We, and we thank you for the anniversaries of 15 years of marriage and 39 years of marriage. Father God, what, a, what an absolute honor it is to, to see people upholding that marriage as it should be. And Lord, we just uh, think of all those who are needing a touch from you. Lord, we heard about all the unspoken requests. Uh, uh, Lord, we just uh, ask for it. A, a touch uh, in each situation, Lord. We know that there were four more than what was what hands were raised. Where we think of uh, Deb Mack will happen with her mother passing. Where we just lift her up to you, and and, and Lord, uh, the and whole entire family asking for for peace and strength. And we think of Lamar and Heather who were not here this morning, and just to allow them uh, relief and 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 comfort and. And healing at this time, Lord, we um, we we thank you for uh, Jonas and how far you brought him. Lord, we ask that everything would be healed up as they would look on Tuesday, and Lord, he'd be uh, allowed to do uh, what he wants to do. And Father God, for uh, Arlene and her finger, Lord, we just ask for you to bring a, a healing touch on her and the Cunningham family. Lord, uh, Lord, we just praise you and, and just ask for for uh, help for them uh, during this time. And uh, Lord, we uh, also just thank you for nine years of uh, being a pastor to a great group of people. Lord, we just uh, thank you for placing us here. And Lord, we just ask for uh, many years to come as your blessing is here at Leatherwood Church. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time. Lord, I just ask that your inspiration, your leading, your guiding would be here today. Uh, lead us into your word. Lord, lead us to the truth. And Father God, we thank you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Ask the ushers to come forward for the morning times and offerings. Let's go ahead and stand and worship together.
removed from the start of the school year. Yay. Anybody anybody have kids that are sick of school yet? They look wonderfully, marvelously happy. But how many of you had someone go to preschool, elementary, or high school this year? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, Addison is now in first grade, and already we can tell that this year is a little bit different. Um, this is just our first time through it. So, uh, uh, she comes home with homework in first grade every night. First grade. Every night except for Fridays. And, and just over the past couple of weeks, I've seen her take out a science book and open it and read through the chapter. And she brought home all of her tests and, and got 100%, so there's not even anything Dad can say wrong about it. Uh, but uh, I, I began to wonder when it became the parent of a fifth grader instead of a first grader. But uh, it just seems like uh, she's just uh, so far ahead of first grade. But uh, now, of those who raise your hands of sending someone off to school, how many of you think that sending uh, your children to school is important? Two people. Okay. <laughs> but... Uh, this spring when we were on vacation, we, uh, we took Addison out for a week of kindergarten uh, to go with us. We didn't think anything of it to miss a week of kindergarten. We can catch up that, that week. But uh, actually to get uh, uh, the request, uh, the principal to sign off of it, they, she had to have, keep a journal the entire trip. And she had to attend at least one educational activity on each day of the trip in kindergarten. It's changed a little bit over the years, hasn't it? But uh, I, I guess that if they're learning that much in a week that I should be excited about the this, this school district that we're living in, I guess. But, uh, but we're also not too far removed from the start of another school year. How many of you sent a kid off to college? See, college raises the bar a little bit because you got to put the money up front, don't you? 
You, you've got to put your money down on, on the investment and it's you're hoping and praying and hoping and praying that that money is going uh, to help them gain the knowledge and the understanding and the training that they're, they're going to, to, to need for a lifetime to come. And, and you're hoping that that investment pays off and, and it will lead to much bigger things for your child in the future. So why, why all of this talk about education and knowledge? Well, uh, on vacation just last week, I, I learned a phrase, and it's a Latin phrase. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but how many of you have heard the phrase, scientia es potentia? I know there's some learning institutions that have it written above the, the pillars of their walls, and, and they're very proud of it. Anyone know what it means? They stopped teaching Latin long ago. Thank goodness. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a phrase attributed to Sir Francis Bacon, and it simply means knowledge is power. And, and in our civilization here in the United States, we, we believe that to be true. After all, if, if knowledge is power, then can my kindergartner miss a week of classes? Well, yes, but in the eyes of the school, no, that, that, that can't be, that can't happen because she'll miss out on something that, that you know, that, that, will, that will help her for her entire future. And we believe in the phrase and we believe in the pursuit of knowledge. How many of you believe in the pursuit of knowledge? A little less the older I get, I guess. But, uh, and if you don't believe me that, that we think that this is important, I want to take a closer look and focus in on, on the main things that we do as a church. Our most important meeting times center around gaining knowledge and learning. Just this morning, we had Sunday school classes, and though we ripped on our teacher tremendously, we, you know, we come hoping to, as adults to gain something, and we bring our children here hoping that, that they'll have the moral, get, gain the morals and the, the biblical knowledge that we would hope that they would have from Sunday school. Here now in our worship services, I hope you come to hoping to, to, to learn a little bit more and to glean a, little, a few more nuggets of wisdom as well. And, and, and our Bible study was the most well-attended Bible study to this point. And, and you come wanting to learn and wanting to know the Bible and, and, and the pursuit of knowledge that will help you in everyday living. It seems like even the church is living by the motto that knowledge is power. But I want you to think about this for a second. Is the knowledge of God the goal of why we exist as a church? It's a hard question, isn't it? Because it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like, well, if knowledge is good and knowledge is power, then the knowledge of God is why we exist as a church. But I contend that that's just a step in the right direction. But too many times we make the knowledge of God what we're all about instead of knowing God what we're all about. You see, in Christianity it was never meant to be just knowing about God. Instead we are to know Him. And, and, and even more, and, and more deeply we are to follow Him. And that requires so much more than just the accumulation and the build up of knowledge. And even though it's been quite a few weeks since we've been here, we've been looking at the book of Acts and, and we've been asking ourselves the question, where do we go from here? What, what step what is our next step? And, and as I continue on in chapter 5, I believe that, that chapter 5 gives us clear instructions on what the next step should be. And the things that we, we, we should look at to attain that are just higher than, than just mere knowledge and learning. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 12 through 16. This is what it says. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered around from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and all those tormented by evil spirits, 
and all of them were healed. Now, of all the stuff that happens in that scripture, how much of it has to do with learning? How much of it has to do with knowledge? Or how much of it has to do with just knowing God and following Him and what He wants for the church? You see, we have to stop making the pursuit of knowledge the end game of Christianity and realize that, that the accumulation of knowledge is just a small part of being a Christian. There's so much more to it and so much better things. How many of you hated school? <laughs> a teacher over here hated school. <laughs> but... Or how many of you disliked certain parts of school? It became a burden after a while. And, and we do not want the church to become that. Instead, we want to look at some things that, that we should be about and that we should grow into that are much more than just gaining another lesson or, 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 or looking to the Bible to, to help to get one more piece of wisdom. I want to ask the Lord to bless our time before we, we look closer into this subject. Father God, Lord, grant us your wisdom. Give us your power. Lead us into your truth. Father, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, after college, I had the unique situation of actually living in the town that I went to college in. Anybody live in the town you went to college in for a while after? A couple of you. But uh, I, I met Kim my senior year, so I thought it'd be nice to stick around. I had reasons. I, so I found a house in the area, and I had a teaching job, and, and I started doing ministry for the first time in your life. But now... One thing about living in a college town is that you can get a discount on almost anything if you have your student ID card. If, I, if you've never lived in a, in a college town like that, all you have to do is show it and you get $15 off at this restaurant and you get 10% off at this restaurant. And I can still remember $3 unlimited bowling on Thursday. If you showed your ID, you could walk right in and bowl. And, and, and $3 movie tickets, it was a steal living there with a, with a college ID. And the best part was I got to use all the, the, the amenities on campus, all the, the workout rooms and, and, and all of that. And, and so I didn't throw my college ID away after I graduated. I decided if I'm going to live here for a while, I might as well take advantage of, of all of these things because I'm cheap. And, uh, and, and I can remember one day... And it was toward the end of my time there, but uh, they had built a brand new recreational center on campus. And, and you know what? I had gone to school for four years there and had paid my tuition, and I'd actually paid to have this student, this building built. And so I was looking forward to getting to use it. And so I walked into the building, and, and little did I know that they had changed up the student IDs at the beginning of that year. And so I walked in, and I was wearing all my workout clothes, and I was like, so I'm going to have a great time today. I'm meeting friends here, and I laid my ID down on the table, and I went to pick it back up, and the, the girl behind the counter said to me, Sir, you're no longer a student here. If you want to come in, it's going to cost you five bucks. I was busted. She was right. I was no longer a student. My time as a student had came to an end. I had got my degree, and, and, and there was more for me to do out in the world than just rely on my student card to get me discounts, you know. And, and it was time for me to, to leave the student life behind and to go out into the world and make my life count. But I'm not the only one that needed to get past their time as being a student. I want you to take a look at what our scripture says for this morning. It says, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. Now, it'd be easy to look at this scripture and, 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 and to, to, go, to just hop right past the fact that somewhere along the line, this group of men that were once called disciples had undergone a name change. And for the rest of the New Testament, they're no longer referred to as disciples. They're instead referred to as what? Apostles. You see, their time of being a disciple had ended, and, and their time now of being an apostle was beginning. They had a new identity. Back in the Gospels, they're always referred to as disciples. 
And the word disciple means this. It comes from a Greek word, and I, I'm going to butcher this, mathetes, which is what we get the word math from uh, in, in our educational system. And it literally means the mental effort needed to think, think something through. A learner, a disciple, a follower of Christ who learns the doctrines from the Bible with its necessary follow-through life applications. So by saying they were disciples, they were saying that, that they were underneath Christ and, and that, that they were learning the doctrines and they were, they were a, a disciple of a learner. They, the disciples, they had gone, been all of this in their past. And so being a disciple is all about gathering knowledge and thinking on that knowledge and making changes to your life based on that knowledge. Now when I was in college, I was taught to be a lifelong learner, but that has nothing to do with remaining a student for the rest of my life. Am I still a student at a university? No. That time has passed. That time has ended. And so now I've got to take what I learned during that time and take it out and use it. Being, being a lifelong learner does not mean that I spend every day in a class and every day in learning more information. It simply means that as I go about, I, I, I learn and I gather information and I use it. But you know what? There is a phenomenon cropping up in this country. And it's called this. It's called the career college student. I see if you, some of you have heard about this, but this is a very real thing. And, it, and it's where the college student, they go and they take four or five years of classes and they get a degree. And then what do they do? They come home. And they decide, well, I don't think I'm done with my education yet. And so they either go for a master's degree or they go for uh, uh, some, another degree. And, and, and very soon, you've got people who are in their 30s. I just read an article about someone who was 35 and going for their sixth degree and have yet to graduate and actually take on responsibility. We laugh at that. But you're not their parents, are you? Their parents are not laughing about this. But they can avoid paying back student loans this way. They can avoid having to get a job. And, and, and they can stay in the comfort of college forever. How many of you had a very comfortable college experience? Amen. And, and I had to laugh. I, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's a dish commercial. It's the hopper. And the, the, there's a guy sitting there talking to the kangaroo next to him. And, 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 and he's talking about their college sports package. And, and they, they're, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we can have every college game. And we, it's like going back to college. And the guy next to him turns around and it's Matt Liner. Any of you know Matt Liner? He was a quarterback for USC, and he was very good, and he had a very good college career, and he got to the NFL and did nothing. And he's like, take me with you. Back to college. And, 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 and he yells across, he said, hey, we can go back to college. And there's another, uh, another old college athlete who did nothing in the pro saying, yeah, I'm going to go. And then all of a sudden, Brian Bosworth comes in the back, room, back door, and he goes, I'm going back to college. You know, College is a comfortable thing. Knowledge is a comfortable thing. The pursuit of it is a good thing, but there comes a time when you need to let go. The apostles gave up their title of disciple, and they willingly embraced the new role of apostle. This is not an easy transition, because much more is required of the apostle than it is of the disciple, is it not? There's much more responsibility, much more scary situations that you're placed in when you don't have someone over top of you. No longer were they students, yet they continued in knowledge. Now they were apostolos, men sent out on a mission by God, commissioned to do His work, willing to be a messenger to the people. This is a higher calling than being just a student. Can I be brutally honest with you this morning? I don't want to step on too many toes. I did, I, in the church, we have far too many disciples and far too few apostles. We, I've been here for nine years. I said a, a, a little bit ago. The disciples, they sat under Jesus for three years. And then they were sent out. 
We send our college students in to sit underneath a, a professor for four to seven years, and, and then we send them out into the world. And so surely even sitting under a flawed teacher like me for nine years, you're ready to be sent out, I'm hoping. The time of being a student is over. God needs people who are, who are called apostles, who are called teachers, who are called prophets, who are called to, to, to do His good will, to get up and get out of the classroom, to get out of the church and be the messenger, the preacher of His word, the bearer of good news, because you're full of knowledge. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you're full of knowledge. You, you've heard how many sermons, how many Bible lessons, you've read the Bible for yourself, you're fully equipped. You know how I know that? Because the Holy Spirit does that. That's not a work done by me. It's the Holy Spirit who is perfect and pure and, and, and powerful who makes you and moves you from being a career disciple into the higher calling that God has for your lives. You see, the apostles are no longer called disciples because they have moved beyond it. The second step that, that, that I see and in, in, in the thing that I see in the scripture is that the apostles, once they became apostles and were no longer disciples, once they're apostles, they got out among the people. If you look at our scripture again, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Now let me just break this down for you because I was completely confused by it at the very beginning. But uh, the believers, they met together at Solomon's Colony. That was where they met together for church. And, and, and they found themselves having trouble getting other people to join them. Bringing other people in to meet with them at Solomon's Colony. Why was this? Well, if you remember a few weeks back, what the thing that happened in, in Acts chapter 5, just previous to this, was the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And, and they had lied about a gift that they were bringing to the church, and, and they were struck down dead, and their bodies were dragged out of Solomon's colony. Now, you can imagine why people didn't want to come into their church. Because that was something that got around. That's a story you hear about. If, if a couple people were struck down here in church, I guarantee you'd think we'd be in the news later today. You know, that the leader vindicator would be out here wanting to publish. But they had a problem because the people were afraid, even those who believed were afraid to come because they wanted to make sure I have to have everything in order because if I don't, if I don't have everything just right, look at what can happen. So more and more of them were weary of joining them in their worship service. And yet at that very time, it says this, that more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So at the time when, when, when church attendance seemed down and it seemed like nobody wanted to come, the kingdom of God was growing. That more and more people, and when church attendance had stagnated, more and more people because of this. The apostles went out to the people. When people no longer just came into the door of their church, they said, we've got, it, we've got this message that we've got to get out. And so they went outside the doors of the church. And the church grew. Even when the church appeared as something scary, something, something people didn't understand, something that, that they would never come in their mess, they took their message outside the doors. You see, part of ending your time as a student involves you leaving the classroom. Part of that is to have you uh, getting up and walking out and facing the world that's outside. As we learn, as we look at these disciples turned apostle, all of their ministry happened outside of the walls of the church. They realized this new calling that they were under involved them being messengers. Now think about that word messenger. Do you need a messenger, Alan, to deliver a message to Larry? Sometimes. <laughs> On a Sunday morning, you need a messenger to get it back there. Now, paper airplane will do just fine. You, know? but you don't need a messenger to take the message from one pew to another. 
You need a messenger to take the message that you gain from in here on a Sunday morning, and you need a messenger to take it out to someone who will never step inside the doors. They delivered that message, and they made disciples. They listened to Jesus when he told them in Matthew 28, he told them, go therefore. And when he told them to be witnesses in all part, different parts of the world in Acts chapter 1, they did. So why don't we? It's because I think that we're still stuck in disciple mode. We're still in the gathering of information mode. I know the world is rough. How many of you had a rough week this week? A few of you. That was more hands than I expected to see. When I said, how many of you had a praise? There was like one. When I said, how many of you had a rough week? Everyone's like, that's me. I get it. I know times are tough. I know that each and every one of you are going through a lot and it's only natural for you to want to come here on a Sunday and, and get pumped up and, and get fed for the week ahead so you can just make it through to the next week and, and, and to experience something here that's comfortable and familiar and, and, and that will get you prepared to go out into the world. But that's not what we're called to. That's not what he's asked of us. He says... He, he says, I want you to get out. I want you to go there for I want you to make disciples. I want you to get other people equipped for the work. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, go there for And I want you to turn to your other neighbor and say, you can do this. And I know this because the Holy Spirit has promised to be with us. When you think of what you can accomplish on your own, you may not think that you're capable of doing something so spectacular or something wonderful, but your partner is the Holy Spirit of God. Your partner is, is, is the, all the power of God manifested inside of you and giving you the words to say and giving you the, the gifts that you are needed to perform the work that you are called to. So the apostles got out among the people. Last thing I see that the apostles, not disciples, did. The apostles performed signs and wonders. This is my favorite part. How many of this is your favorite part? Awesome. This part, this is the part that gives me hope. It's the part that, that makes me want to get the most out, get out the most, and, and to do this the most. If we we'll move ourselves out of disciple mode and into apostle mode, we're promised in the scripture that the signs and wonders will come. Because it happened then. Let's read it again. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. healed. You know, when Jesus said that, that, that he must go so someone greater than he can come, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And we have here, we had Jesus, he healed a woman just by, she touched the hem of his garment. And, and her faith healed her. Now we have Peter walking around. And I want you to think about this. And people were gathering in just trying to get into his shadow. And they were finding healing just by his shadow passing by. That wasn't Peter's power that was on display there, was it? But it was the power of the Holy Spirit through Peter. Now let me just say this. This is the fifth mention of signs and wonders in five chapters of Acts so far. So we've had five chapters... This is a Red Bank math lesson for you. And we've had five mentions of signs and wonders. So how many mentions per chapter is that? One per chapter. When something is repeated over and over again in Scripture, that means it's something that's pretty important. How many of you need to be told more than once to do something? Sometimes it, 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 it takes a while to sink in. But when it's, when it's repeated over and over again, and it's going to be repeated at least five more times through the rest of the book, we can't just brush it off. We can't just try to explain it away because we don't see the signs and wonders on, on, on a regular basis. Instead, we have to find out what are we doing that, that, that's contrary to the Word of God so that we're not seeing it. Let me tell you, 
The, the, the biggest lie that's told in the church today is that signs and wonders were only needed and only available during the time of the disciples. Because that, that was how the church grew. Do we serve the same God? Yes. yes. Does, does our God change a lot? No. Does he have the same power that was available to him back then or is he a weaker God now? No, it's the same power. And so we have to find our way back to the times of signs and wonders. How do we get there? First, we get out of student and knowledge mode. When you're constantly gathering information and gathering data and, 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 and seeing what, what we can wrap our minds around, your Christian faith begins to become a list of facts. You understand what I'm saying? And so our Christian faith becomes something that, that, that we can see and we can experience it. And it's all that happens right in front of us. But when we do that, when we just may remain in student mode, that leaves no room for the unexplainable. But our God is a God of the unexplainable. He's constantly doing things that don't make sense. Because if you're in student mode and, and you see... Oh, Peter walked by and knows that we're in his shadow. We're healed. You say, that doesn't make any sense. That, that, that doesn't, I've never seen that happen. And so we begin to, to, to block out what God is capable of doing. We need to move beyond that. And secondly, I'm going to sound like a broken record. We have to get out among the people. When we look at this, the apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. It wasn't in the church building that they were meeting that the signs and wonders happened, was it? Because people were afraid to come in there, so there would be no reason for signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are to, to show other people who don't believe how big our God is. And so the signs and wonder occurred as they got out in the streets. They happened on the sides of streets as they walked by. It happened in the towns that they visited. And as long as we still live in a society where the church is mostly filled of believers, in which unbelievers don't feel necessarily comfortable walking in the doors, the signs and wonders will continue to be manifested where? Inside or outside? Outside, because that's the people that need to see them. I want the signs and wonders. I miss the signs and wonders. It, it, I love the great stories and the testimony that come from signs and wonders. Some of those great stories that you hear. It, it, it's powerful. We have to get out and get among the people. I have a question for you. How many of you want a church filled with signs and wonders? How many of you are okay with, without, with a church without signs and wonders? The onus is on us because God is capable, God is able, God has the power to do anything that he wants. But we have to get past our, our need to always just be a student and to keep learning. And we have to move into, we talked about this quite a few months ago, into the five, that I believe that there are five places where you can be placed into being a teacher or an evangelist or a pastor or a prophet or apostle. There's five offices. God wants to move you into one of them. God given you the gifts to move into one of those places. And as long as you just continue to remain a student, and, and the signs and wonders aren't going to come. It's time to move into a greater season in your life as a Christian. And we have to turn our focus outside of the walls. When, when I came here, this was a hurting church. You can say amen. It, it was a hurting church in a very rough place. There has to be a point when we get past that. When, when, when we move into someplace greater. Is it better now than it was when we came here? There's only a few of you that were here nine years ago to say amen to that. It's time for us to, to, to turn the focus, not so much, and I'm not saying give up the, the stuff that we do here on the inside, but I'm saying it's time to pick ourselves up and say, thank you, Lord, for bringing us through this and standing up and going out and making disciples 
like we are called to do. People are dying and going to hell. That used to bother me tremendously. But sometimes we get to a place where we just kind of push that off. But that bothers me again. And we have the means necessary inside of us to save their souls. Will you take it to them? Will you enter into the times of signs and wonders again where you don't understand and, and you have questions and, and but that you just step out in faith into a greater calling and among the people? Just want you to say a simple prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Now I want you to remain open to hearing his voice. Is he calling you to something greater? And if you're here this morning, I would say, yes, he is. He's calling you to move beyond being a disciple. And I want you this morning just to spend some time with him. I want you to ask him, Lord, who are the, the certain people that, that you're calling me to? And, 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 and what is the deeper level or, or the, the place in ministry that you would have me to go into? We have your back as a church. I have your back as a pastor. God is calling you to move from disciple to fill in the blank. It's between you and God to determine what that is. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and, and to play softly. But Some of you already know what that next step is. Some of you already know and, and have been fighting it for, for years or just, or, or just refusing to take the next step. But if you feel that calling, that, that tugging to move to a deeper place, to move beyond just being a disciple, but to being something greater, as you pray, just come up here and I just want to pray with you. I don't want to make a big thing about it. I just want to pray your God's blessings as you move into this new season of your life. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I just repeat that prayer. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Lord, speak to each one here. Give them attentive hearts. May they know exactly what you are calling them to. Lord, help us. Move us. If we are ready into a new season, a new calling, a new time, take us out of our disciple mode, out of our gaining knowledge mode, out of our need to just to just fill in another piece of information and Lord bring us into a time where your Holy Spirit fills each one of us, equips each one of us in power into this new season, this new calling. Lord, I thank you and I praise you you're going to do here. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God's calling you into that new season and you know it and you want prayer. Just ask that you come up and we're going to pray pray over you and uh, anoint you in your time of, of what God is calling you to. Just come as we sing and, uh, and, and have it, it's, it's a step out saying, God, I believe you, you're going to do this. And I'm not just going to sit here. I'm going to, to take that step of faith and accept this call in all my life. Would you come and do that as we close in the song? Let's dance. Oh, that's 
thank him for those who came forward with the courage to, to step into this new season. Please be praying for them. This isn't an easy time. Some of you already know that. When, when you, you step out, it's not an easy time, but it's a blessed time. And so pray for them as a church. Have their back. Ask them how it's going. And don't, don't be surprised if they unload on you and say, it's not going very well. Listen, be there for them. Lord, we thank you. You are good. Father, we pray for these that are up front and those that are in the pews. Be with them this week. Send them out among the people. Make their calling clear. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Don't forget about Evermore's today. Uh, we're going there right after the service. Uh, it's in New Bethlehem. If you don't know where it is, just ask me. Let me know.